I want to share with you some of the wonders of this rosary because it is just that. It's wonderful. And I want to start this talk by giving you uh, an example of just how incredible it is and how, to some people initially, it can seem rather bizarre and strange, because it is on one level. Now, if you don't know me, maybe some, I, I am curious, how many of you don't know my story? No shame. Okay. Shame on you. No, just kidding. <laughs> Suckers. No. Cool. I'm nobody. My story is, in a nutshell, this. I was a bad, really bad, okay? I'm not here to tell my conversion story. A lot of people get bummed out by that. They're like, you're not going to tell your story? I've told that thing so many times, it's ridiculous. I love it. But you can buy it on video, DVD, YouTube, it's everywhere. It's all, you know. The essence of it is that I was not raised in a Christian, Catholic household of any kind, and I went through a very tumultuous youth. I was in two drug rehabs. I had long hair down on my waist. I got a tattoo with a Grateful Dead. I got kicked out of the country of Japan. I was in jail. I was homeless. That's probably the shortest version I've ever given of my conversion story. <laughs> and then I had a huge conversion, obviously, uh, because my parents converted to Catholicism, and then two and a half years after they did, I trailed along, and I had a huge conversion. Well, after, well, what, what, what helped my conversion, what brought about my conversion, was a book that my parents, newly, new Catholics of two, over two years, had purchased a book on the Virgin Mary. I didn't know who that was or what it was. That was how ignorant I was of Christianity. I read that book on their bookshelf one night. It was about Our Lady and some alleged Marian apparitions, and it changed my life. Next day, next day, I went to a Catholic church. In my long-haired funkiness, I dressed like an alien. You don't even know, okay? I went to a Catholic church, and I went inside, reluctantly, I really didn't even want to go in, but I went in, and when I went in, what I experienced was this. In that little church, it was called Our Lady of Victory Naval Chapel on Norfolk Naval Air Station, largest naval facility in the world, because my stepfather was a military officer. Go into that chapel, and right in the front, nobody else in the entire church, but right in the front, by the door I came in, were five Filipino women. Now, I love to say this because it's true. You don't mess with Catholic Filipino women. Okay? They are special forces in the spiritual life. They are green berets. They will take you down. Okay? They mean business. You know, they do. In a certain sense, we wouldn't even be here tonight without them because, you know, Our Lady of Peña Francia, the whole Filipino connection thing, you know, they're responsible for so much. So I walk into this church because my, my mother had become a Catholic by one Filipino woman. This woman helped my mom talk to a priest. My mom brought my dad. They became Catholic. I go into this church, and there's five Filipino women sitting there, and I freaked out because I know what these people are capable of. <laughs> they, they make people Catholic. I, didn't, I, was, you know, I go back to the church, and all of a sudden these Filipino women start some kind of seance. That's what it looked like to me. One of them goes up and fires up candles on some altar looking thing. And there's a boat hanging from the ceiling because it's in the naval chapel. And she goes back to her place and she goes into her purse. And like often happens, and you know what I mean if you know Filipinos, there's always a self-appointed, self-appointed matriarch who tells everybody else what to do. You know, I, guess I love Filipinos. Had I not become a priest, I'd have married a Filipina. I'd be living in Surigao, surfing my brains out. But that, that's not God's plan. Okay? I love Filipinos. But there's always a matriarch who tells everybody else what to do. You got to do, got to do, got to do, and you better do it, right? <laughs> so this one woman goes into her purse, and I'm, I'm in the back, and all the way in the back, and she pulls out this thing, like a necklace-looking thing, and she starts doing some incantation to the boat, the mystical ship hanging from the ceiling that she fired up candles underneath. I don't know, this is my first time in a Catholic church. I'm clueless. And she's, all I can hear is this. Okay, now I'm not making fun of Filipinos. I love Filipinos. Salamat po to you forever, okay? For everything you've ever done. I love you to death. I love you. Not making fun of you. But to a white boy, when he hears a Filipino speak, it sounds a little funny. So all I heard was this Filipino woman leading her four sisters in this. 
Hail Mary, full of good, but I got a, but I got a, but cow. What? What on earth is that, right? Hail something. And then the other four reciprocated together, saying, Holy Mary, full of good, but I got a, amen. And it kept going back and forth. And I'm in the back, like, what on earth is this, right? And after a few minutes, and they're going, man, they're like in fifth overdrive. They're flying through this incantation. And then this lady, because Filipino women are bold. They, these women are serious, man. This woman turns around to me all the way in the back, long-haired freak in the back, and she puts up this necklace in my face and looks at me and yells out across the void of the empty pews, young man, do you want to pray the next decade, next decade? Okay. I don't know what this Filipino woman is trying to communicate to me, okay? Because I'm not educated. I had dropped out of high school. You know, I, was, I didn't have a lot of education. But I wasn't stupid. Decade means 10 years to me, right? So I'm looking at her. I'm like, what? I don't even know what to say. Because she's asking me to pray for 10 years. So I'm like... So she tried to clarify it because she could see I was like a deer in headlights. So she goes, the second side of for me study is the second side of for me study. I have no idea what the second side of for mystery is. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, your little coven, your little cult sisterhood, when that priest comes in, you're going down, right? <laughs> this, this ain't church. That's what I'm thinking, right? I don't know what church is supposed to do, but this don't seem right. Well, they car carry on with this thing at mock speed. They're flying through this and they finish and... That was my first experience of a rosary. No idea what, what it was doing, what they were doing. Well, long story short, within a week, they had taught me the whole thing. I became their little project. They gave me rosaries, like, you know, I had rosaries in my pockets and my, you know, everything all, all around me. I learned the, these mysteries, and then I was, you know, leading the decades. I found out what it was, and I fell in love with it. And then a year, within a year, I became a Catholic, and now here I am, you know, as a priest. Well... I say that because a lot of people think that this is just some little silly thing for old women and weak people, and it's not. This thing, it looks weak, right? Just like it, it, it's not a sacrament, it's a sacramental, meaning it disposes you to receive sanctifying grace, but it looks, I mean, I, if I wanted to, I'm strong enough, I could break this apart. It's not strong physically. Would you believe that this thing right here Satan hates. You can whip the daylights out of the forces of darkness with this little 53-stringed beaded rope. You can. It's proven fact. I just ended yesterday, actually, a what's called the Irresistible Novena, a 54-day rosary novena to Our Lady for my book, begging her to kiss it. I want Our Lady to kiss the book, anoint it with your lips, Mother, so that everyone who reads it knows what the rosary is, that it's a sword, that it's for warriors, that it's to take down falsehoods and raise up saints. Please, Mother, hold it in your hands, kiss it, anoint it. Three weeks of that novena, 27 days, are for the intention. The following three weeks, uh, the, the following three novenas, 27 days, are in thanksgiving for the petition. Where does it come from? Now, if you thought I was bad, which I was. Let me tell you this story. How many of you have heard of a guy named Blessed, yes, Blessed, Bartolo Longo? How many of you have heard of him? A few here and there, not many. Let me tell you about this guy, okay? There was a guy in Italy in, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, who was raised a Catholic, grew up in Italy, right? Duh, but then he fell away. Because there was this strong anti-Catholic movement in the colleges. He grew up in Naples. He got educated, and he fell away from the faith, and he got involved in spiritualism. Today, we would call it New Age. A lot of New Age out here, right? Sedona and whatnot, right? <laughs> he was a New Ager. He was, he was into, you know, if we could make analogies, hand palm reading and doing tarot cards and looking at the stars, trying to find meaning, you know. He thought he was super intelligent, and he was on some level, and he was searching. But he got wrapped up in spiritualism, and he started going to seances and participating in occult practices. And you know what happened? 
he got ordained a satanic priest. I'm not making this up. He was ordained in a cult and began to worship the devil. And it got so bad that he got depressed. This often happens when you're involved with the occult. It's really. Even minor things. Uh, I'll spare you some of the things I slam normally. You can get my books. It's in there. Because there's a lot of dangers out there today, and people think things are just exercise. Mm, not just exercise. You're yoking yourself to spirits, really and truly. And people think it's just a mat. No, it's a prayer rug. And the postures you do are postures of the Hindu religion. Not kidding. And they're in Vatican documents saying it's an, it opens you up to things that are anti-Christian. Not my words, the words of the Church of Christ the Catholic Church. So, he gets involved in so many crazy things and he gets depressed, is suffering from anxiety, and at one point is even thinking about committing suicide. That's how bad it got. And then you know what happened? He talked to a Dominican priest. There's a lot of connections, as we'll see as we go through this. This Dominican priest told him about the promises that Our Lady had made long time ago to St. Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans, that for people who propagate and promote the rosary, they will find salvation in Christ. He clung to those words and he had a huge conversion, thanks to that Dominican priest, and he changed his life around. Renounced spiritualism, even one time busted into a seance, right in the middle of the seance, and renounced everybody in there, held up a rosary and told them all to repent. Because they were searching, but this contained the truth. And the truth was Jesus Christ and his saving mysteries. And, and then he actually became a third order Dominican and took the name Brother Rosario, Brother Rosary, and went to Pompeii on, a, on an errand, a business errand. He was a lawyer by profession. And he goes down there and he sees the, the dilapidated state of, of the place, the geograph- geographical situation, but the state of souls there. They were wrapped up in spiritualism. Many of them had abandoned the faith. They didn't know know, the, the, the Catholicism of their youth, of their ancestry, and all that. And he felt horrible because he knew he was partly responsible because he had brought many souls away from the faith. And once again, even after his conversion, he contemplated suicide because he thought he was so bound to Satan by his ordination that Satan was just allowing him to see that so that he could prepare him for eternal separation from God. What did he do? He turned back to the rosary. And he said, I will stay in this valley and I will dedicate the rest of my life to promote this rosary. And he did. And he started in little ways and he built this huge church and then he built a basilica. Today, the Basilica of Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii, the most famous, largest church in Catholicism dedicated to the rosary, was started by a former Satanist. Really? And then... Because in those days, in the confraternity of the rosary, you had to have an image dedicated to Our Lady of the Rosary, which showed Our Lady giving the rosary to St. Dominic. So he, he got one, but it was a horrible image. It was, it was so bad that nobody thought it was worth anything that they actually brought it from Naples, where it was purchased, to Pompeii on a pile of dung. That's how bad it was in condition. He fixed it up, cleaned it up, and put it up for people to venerate. Well, a few years later... A little girl named Fortuna Agrelli was sick, super sick, to the point of almost death. Doctors had given up on her, but her parents started a novena, a rosary novena. And they were going to pray it, three of them, 27 days. Well, during that novena, Our Lady appeared to the little girl, Fortuna. And the little girl pleaded with her and called her specifically, Our Lady of the Rosary, please heal me. Please ask God to give me health. And Our Lady said that he would through her intercession. And that she was very pleased that she had used that title, Our Lady of the Rosary. And she said to little Fortuna, when you're done making the the three novenas for your intention, make three more in Thanksgiving, 54-day novena, called the Irresistible Novena. I just finished it yesterday. It works. One of my intentions was to get an endorsement for my book that I haven't even fully written yet, although I have it in manuscript. I'm just cleaning it all up and everything. It's a project. I sent it to a bishop, uh, who probably some of you may have heard now, in Nigeria, who last year 
had a vision of Jesus. Go on YouTube tonight and read about this. It'll blow your mind. He, he's, in, he's a bishop in Nigeria where Boko Haram, radical Muslims, are kidnapping girls and doing unbelievable things I will not mention here. And they're decapitating people and they're, they're destroying things because that's what they do. He had a vision of Jesus, this bishop, and Jesus appeared to him with a sword, with a sword of steel. And he's handed, he held it out for the bishop to take it. The bishop went out to take it from Jesus. When he touched it, the sword changed into a rosary. And Jesus said to the bishop, Bishop Oliver Dash Dome, that's his name. He said to the bishop, Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. Three times. I sent the manuscript to the bishop as part of my intent. I want that bishop to endorse my book. Because I talk about the rosary as a spiritual sword. Guess what happened? He endorsed it. Already. I don't know this dude. <laughs> right? I haven't even finished the book yet. And he's already endorsed it. I put a lot of other intentions in there as well for conversion of my family members, for healings, for different things. I trust that Our Lady, in her time and in in God's time, will answer those prayers according to what they see best. These are amazing things that so many people don't know about today. I only heard about Blessed Bartolo Longo. Do you remember in 2002, St. John Paul II wrote a letter on the rosary? Do you remember that? And he gave us the luminous mysteries, which basically turned the, the rosary not just into a sword, but a modern lightsaber, updating it for the times that we live in, right? Luminous mysteries, lightsaber. He gives us these mysteries, and in that document, he kept mentioning this dude named Blessed Bartolo Longo. I'm like, I never heard of this dude. I know saints. I, I mean, I love the saints, but I'm like, who is this guy? So I looked him up, and I found out the dude was a former satanic priest, and I thought I was bad. I never did anything like that. Holy smokes, right? That shows you the power that this rosary has because it does have power. Where does this come from and why does it even exist? Well, for over 800 years now, it's been basically in the hands of every saint. I pretty much guarantee you that any saint since the year 1208 has prayed this. I pretty much guarantee it. What was happening in the year in the 13th century that this was given to us? Well, in Europe, in France in particular, there was a heresy that was spreading like crazy. It was called Albigensianism. And it basically said that uh, Jesus is not God, that he's not, you know, special, that the flesh is bad. So why would God become flesh when the flesh is corrupt? That doesn't make any sense. And therefore, they denied the incarnation, that God became man. Things like the Eucharist, his passion, that he would suffer, that God would suffer for us in the flesh. They denied it. And they were preaching all over, and they were getting a lot of converts, like big-time people being drawn out of it. He was a huge threat. But there was one man who was a regular diocesan priest. He followed actually a thing called an Augustinian order, but that's another thing, Augustinian rule. He was preaching, and he was trying so hard. He was zealous. He was on fire. And he was preaching everywhere, and he walked around. But he wasn't having a lot of fruit. And he was kind of getting bummed out. And he went to a forest in France, and he prayed for three days, begging heaven for an answer, for help from on high to help him. And Our Lady came and she gave him this as a spiritual sword. Those were medieval times. Those were times of chivalry and knights. Actually, in those days, founders of religious communities, like this one called the Mercedarians, they had a beautiful white habit, similar to the Dominicans. Do you know what it was part of their habit? A sword. Literally, a sword. These were days of men. Oh, we've come a long way from those days. Really and truly. He was given this by Our Lady, not to be a physical sword, but to be a spiritual sword and to take this into spiritual combat. And she said that it would be a battering, battering ram against heresy. And it, by preaching on the mysteries, would draw souls back to the truth of Christ if he showered them with the angelic salutation. Hail, full of grace, 
the Lord is with you. These are not man-made words. And if he said the Our Father, these words weren't are invented by you and me. These are the words that came from the lips of the God-man, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Spiritual power, when you combine them, when you put them around one simple thing and meditate on the mysteries of the life of Christ, it has power. Do you know he went out and started preaching and did so much good that became the greatest preacher of his time? He formed a community called the Order of Preachers. And they went to the ends of the earth and began to spread this. But you know what happened? (laughs) Satan got in the mix. Satan can't have a weapon like this. So he tried. Oh, he tried so hard to destroy it, to get people to stop praying it. And on some level, it worked. Less than one century after the life of St. Dominic, this was almost forgotten. It was. Documents were burned. Why? Well, do you know what happened in the, in the 14th century? The Black Death, the Black Plague. One-fourth of all Europe died. Not making this up, Google it. One-fourth of Europe. That's just Europe. Parts unknown yet, undiscovered at that time, also suffered from this. But we don't know the numbers. One-fourth of the population of Europe died. And as people were trying to save their lives, they were burning lots of things, places that were contaminated. So many books were burned. That would have been about this. Satan doesn't want any evidence of the weapon. I'll give you an example. In modern times, St. Faustina, when she received the revelations of our Lord, hopefully you know who she is, from our Lord about divine mercy, and our Lord said to her, basically, write it in a diary. You know what happened? A lot of people don't know this. Satan tricked her, appearing as an angel of light, and said to her, burn it. You know what she did? Thinking she was being obedient to an angel of light, she burned it. She burned her diary. What was in that diary? The message of divine mercy. Satan's going to hate that message. A new form of prayer on ordinary rosary beads. She burned it. Then our Lord appeared to her and said, My daughter, that wasn't me. That wasn't an angel of light. You were tricked. Start writing again. And she did. Satan will try to destroy what he himself can't have. And sometimes, sadly, he has great success in this. He did for like 150 years. And then you know what happened? Amazing things happened. Our Lord, our God, provided a place where this would be held for a while. In the 14th century, England became known as the Dowry of Mary. In England, it was offshore. It wasn't on mainland Europe. It had its own plague stuff going on, but they didn't abandon this. Right after the death of St. Dominic in 1221, the Dominicans, his, his friars, went to England, and they brought this with them. And this flourished in parishes. They would leave these in baskets at the front of a church so that people, if they didn't possess their own, could pick one up and use it. These things are recorded in documents. They would have it so that in colleges... The the students were required to pray it. Even in some, the president himself was required to pray it every day. It was held offshore for safekeeping until the Black Death was over. And then it would come back to mainland Europe in an amazing way. At the beginning of the 15th century, there was a movement among groups to reform, to become more zealous because they'd become lax during the Black Death They were more concerned about saving their lives, obviously. And they become kind of mediocre and lukewarm in in their living out of their commitments. The Franciscans, the Dominicans, and a whole bunch of others. This is called the Observant Reform Movement. And during that time, there were certain other groups that were even given different forms of a rosary. How many of you have heard heard about the Brigitine Rosary from St. Bridget of Sweden? How many of you have heard about that one? Or the Seven Sorrows of Mary Rosary? Probably you heard about that from Cabejo, right? Others, founders were given different forms of rosary. There was even Carthusians who were kind of coming up with a really contemplative version. Well, 
Where would be a really good place, if you're going to make that leap back from England to reintroduce people to the ancient rosary, the first rosary, where would be a really good place to do it? The country closest to England, right on the shore. Well, there was a Dominican house there, and there was a guy named Blessed Alan de la Roche, who was a part of the observant reform movement. Our Lord, Our Lady, and even St. Dominic began to appear to him and said, start, re renew it. Teach people about the rosary. Renew the confraternity of the rosary. And he did. And he started it up again. And it spread like wildfire. It spread everywhere. And it, I mean, it was going everywhere. Then guess what happened? <laughs> Satan, aware of what's going on, not liking it. Do you know what happened in the 16th century? You'd have people, fallen away Catholic priests, one named Martin Luther, a fallen away Catholic priest. Yep, I hope you know this stuff. The dude was so, had so many crazy ideas that he started attacking the church, said purgatory isn't real, sacraments, most of them are this nonsense, and he especially went after this. He hated it. There's a book that exists to this day in Germany that has his writings in the margins of a confraternity book on the rosary, and he slams it. What is this nonsense? Why would you pray this? Why would he not like this? Because to him, it was a work. They didn't like works. To him, the, the indulgences that were given by the church, he didn't like indulgences. He didn't believe in them. Purgatory. Why pray for something that doesn't exist? If you're praying the rosary to help souls in purgatory, that's nonsense, he said in the margin of that book. And he got a whole ton of people to go against it. Tons and tons. Then you know what happened? Something else. 16th century was a battle century. After the Protestant rebellion, guess who else started to attack the church in a huge way? They've been attacking it since they came into existence. Islam. Mm -hmm, just like today. Ain't nothing new. We think this is new? Mm, this is a centuries old story here, my friends. They wanted to conquer Rome. Literally, just like today they say. I hope you guys see these videos because you won't see this stuff on the news media. S today, they still want to conquer Rome. They want to wrap a turban around the Pope's head and turn St. Peter's into a mosque. That's a fact. They wanted to do this huge, in a huge way in the 16th century, and they were very close to doing it because Christendom was divided. Many people were leaving the Catholic Church, and there was division amongst Christians, a ripe time to pick, as they called it, the apple of Rome and take it. They'd already taken Constantinople, right, and renamed it Istanbul and turned Santa Sophia, the greatest basic Catholic church in the East, into a mosque. Now they wanted Rome. That's what they've always wanted. And they were cl so close to doing it that they formed a militia, a huge militia, massive in numbers, with skilled men to arm the boats. Unbelievable navy that they had. Guess who was Pope at this time? A Dominican. God provides. St. Pope Pius V. You know what he did? He mandated that all Christendom pray the rosary as a weapon against this threat. Because if they took over Rome, the West is lost. He knew this. And he mandated that this be prayed, and he himself prayed it at, at uh, the Dominican church in Rome. Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. In that church, he himself prayed it. I could go on and on about the story of the battle, but it was a miraculous battle. Everything was against the Christian uh, naval, Navy, but they won. The wind came, turned in their favor, put a fog in, 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 on the Muslim side, and they came in and they won in a miraculous way. And it saved the West, it basically saved Christianity as well. And they were not happy, and they've never been happy since. And they keep trying. My book will detail pretty much every single story of how they've tried to conquer Christendom and still do and want to and are thirsting for its destruction. They've even got something that looks like this and kind of mocks it. I ain't kidding. This is a spiritual battle. It's a clash of creeds. 
It's warfare, spiritually. They, if they could, they would destroy this. There's a battle going on. But you know what happened? God raised up saints, great saints, great men like St. Charles Borromeo and St. Robert Bellarmine and St. Philip Neri and tons, tons and tons. The litany could go on and on and on who preached, promoted this. And then you know what happened? Incredible things happened. Our Lady goes to Mexico to a little dude named Juan Diego, converts 10 million people in like eight years. Dominicans arrive. They set up confraternities of the rosary. The great Catholic missions begin around the world in the 16th century. And what happens? Every single missionary, from St. Francis Xavier, you name it, took this with them everywhere they went. When they went to the Philippines, what happened? Our Lady of Naval, Our Lady of the Rosary of Naval, went there. No matter what country people, the missionaries went to, they brought this. There's even stories, and I'm not making this up, of a woman named Venerable Mary of Agrida, a nun in Spain during this time, who was able to bilocate. I don't know if you know what that is. That means you can be in multiple places at one time. Their saints can do this. St. Saint Padre Pio and a whole bunch of other ones. St. Faustina, tons of them could do this. She was a nun in Spain. Nobody thought anything. You know, she writes books. She prays a lot. Well, in this country... Actually, in your area. You're going to want to look this up. Before this was all mapped out and, out, and this was Arizona, and this was the United States and whatnot, there was a tribe of Indians that were kind of in this area, more in New Mexico and, and West Texas, what we call that now, of, called Humano Indians. Guess what was happening to this tribe? There was a woman coming to them and teaching them about Catholicism. And she was telling them, this is what the Eucharist is. This is who the Virgin Mary is. There's going to be Catholic priests who are going to come soon, and they're going to tell you everything I've been telling you, and they're going to give you the sacraments. Guess what happened? <laughs> Franciscan and then Jesuit missionaries came to that area and came upon a tribe in the middle of nowhere of Indians who knew Catholicism. How in the world? And the tribe said to these missionaries, yes, the woman in blue has been coming to us for years and telling us that you would come. And she told us, and you know what they already had in their hands? Rosaries. Because she, when she was bilocating in her convent in Spain, she had piles of them not being used. She took them with her and gave them to the Indians. The missionaries thought that these Indians were talking, they had a, ver a vision of the Virgin Mary, a woman dressed in blue. But that's, the Indian said, no, we know who the Virgin Mary is. She told us about her, but it wasn't her. It was somebody else, but we don't know who she, she was. Well, in those days, the, the missionaries kept great logs, and some of these missionaries were actually from Spain. So it didn't take very long for them to discover that it was this nun who was reported to be a mystic who was writing a big, fat volume about the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary who was bilocating to this tribe. Look this up. It's a fact. It was even in secular things of the time. Not the Catholic Church making this up. It's true. God wants this everywhere because it has power to change people. You know something interesting? In that battle I was talk, telling you about against uh, Islam called the Battle of Lepanto. It was near Greece. Do you know what was on one of those ships? An image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. A lot of people don't know that. When Our Lady appeared to Juan Diego in the 1530s, the bishop was so in awe of what happened, he immediately had four copies made and sent to various dignitaries and so forth. One of them was sent to Spain. In Spain, the, the, the president gave it to one of the captains, Doria was his name, on one of these ships, and he brought it to the Battle of Lepanto. Our Lady of Guadalupe was at the Battle of Lepanto that conquered the Muslims. Wow. Leave it to Our Lady to do this. See, when there's a void created by Satan, when tons of people are leaving the one true church that Jesus founded and others are attacking it, what will Our Lady do? She'll bring about 10 million converts in eight years. Because she can do it. She can do amazing things like that. And she has throughout history. 
This thing has got so much power. So much power. I don't go anywhere without it. After my little experience with the Filipinos and my conversion, this pretty much has never left my pocket. I mean, this isn't the original one, obviously, but I carry this thing everywhere, right? It's got so much power. You know how long it takes to pray this? 15 to 20 minutes. That's it. Do you know how much time you waste on Facebook every day? I do too. Pray for me. I, just like you, I ain't. Eh. 15 to 20 minutes. That's it. Do you know how long most temptations against purity last? 15 to 20 minutes. It's a fact. This is the antidote, my friends, for the things that, that are against us. By meditating upon this, it's the way out. It disposes us to want to go to confession. Really? I bet you, I totally bet you, that if confessions were going on right now on both sides of the church, and I went up to the people and I said, excuse me, I'm very edified that you're in the line for confession, that's awesome. May I ask, do you pray the rosary? I bet you almost all of them would say that they do. I bet you. But if I went out to the street and just asked a random dude, excuse me, are you Catholic? And he said yes. And then I said, do you go to confession? And he said no. I almost guarantee you that he doesn't pray the rosary. Our Lady leads you to the sacraments. This leads you to Jesus Christ. Really, it doesn't lead you again. You know, this is a biblical prayer. A lot of people think Catholics making up this stuff, just mumbling it over and over and over. No, that's not what we do. Would Jesus really be offended if we meditated upon his scourging, crowning, and all of these glorious mysteries of our salvation? Is he going to say, hey, what are you doing? Don't think about that. 20 minutes? Is that really going to be offensive to our Lord? Absolutely not. No more offensive than if I were a married man and I said to my, my wife every day, honey, I love you, 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 I love you. I mean, if I, I think I know women pretty well. She's not going to be like, okay, fine, right? She's going to be all over that. She's going to be like, yeah, that's right, mm-hmm, yeah, that's right. Because when you're in love, you can never say, I love you enough. Everybody wants to hear that, because you're in love. Well, basically, every Hail Mary that you pray on this is saying to Jesus and Mary, I love you, I love you, I love you. You think that's going to offend them? Absolutely not. The more you say it, the better, as a matter of fact. This is the secret. This is the secret. You know, Continuing on with our little history lesson here, after the great missionary spread it to the whole world, guess what happened? Probably the greatest Marian saint of all time, St. Louis de Montfort, starts cranking out books. True Devotion, phenomenal, read it, best book about Mary ever, period. Nothing compares. And he also wrote another one called The Secret of the Rosary. But you know what happened? <laughs> that evil one got agents to put them in a chest and bury it for 150 years. Nobody knew about the masterpiece. The greatest book ever written on the rosary was buried in a field in France for over 150 years. Satan didn't want you to know. Then you know what happened? Scholars and theologians, sadly, even priests, started to say, what is this? this, this we don't need this stuff. This little devotionals and all this stuff. We've, we've got methods now that show that St. Dominic didn't found that. This thing called historical criticism. Same thing that basically destroyed people's understanding of the scriptures. Jesus didn't walk on water. You know, when he, when he multiplied the bread, that was the miracle. You know, the miracle was they shared. Historical criticism basically said, this is a man-made thing, not of divine origin, Existed before St. Dominic. Blessed Alan David LaRoche was basically a, a, a lunatic. Seriously. Priests said this. Well-known priest in Catholic encyclopedias and such. It's true. And you know what happened? 
in the 1960s and 70s, I was only born in 1972, so I was just coming on the scene, but many of you were around and you know, this basically began to disappear from parishes, even from seminaries. This was banned from many seminary chapels during the 1960s and 70s. That's a fact. Tell me that ain't from Satan. But you know what happened? <laughs> Once again, Jesus and Mary raised up heroes, martyrs that would lay down their life for this. Great people started coming on the scene. How many of you have ever heard of the Legion of Mary? Yeah. The servant of God, Frank Duff. This dude, an Irishman, who spread this thing. The Legion of Mary is the largest Marian group in the entire world. He's done this in the early 20th century because God knew what was going to happen and the destruction that would become St. Maximian Kolbe, everywhere he went. St. Padre Pio almost never left his hand. St. Faustina, we were given a whole new form of devotion on this. So it wasn't just a weapon of truth anymore, but now it would be an instrument of mercy. When Jesus gave the revelations to Faustina about the chaplet, it wasn't, he didn't ask for a new set of beads with maybe seven or somebody. Same amount on this. Now, we basically have got spiritual nunchucks, you know? <laughs> the one-two punch in the spiritual life with the rosary, 20 minutes. This, the chaplet, how long does the chaplet take to pray? Five to seven minutes. It's like, it's like the rosary on training wheels. <laughs> Five to seven minutes. Back in a punch. Other great saints came up, upon the scene. How many of you have heard of Venerable Father Patrick Payton? Nobody compared to Patrick Payton in the promotion of the rosary. This guy was able to go around the world and in places, especially the Philippines, able to gather literally tens of millions of people and pray the rosary in streets. Because in the United States where he lived, although he was born in Ireland, but he lived in the United States, people have basically abandoned it. Said it was useless and pointless. So he went to Brazil and the Philippines and they listened. And miracles happened. Many miracles. Ask a Filipino about the Marcos regime and how they were able to pray this in front of tanks, loaded tanks. Not one bullet was fired. And the, and the, and the guards, the policemen there in the Philippine army later told Cardinal Sin, I know that's a funny name, but his name was Cardinal Sin. <laughs> Whenever people went to his house, he said, welcome to the house of Sin. <laughs> he did. He was funny. So the guards said that before they were going to basically plow over the people with their tanks, they saw a woman who said, stop, these are my people. Ask any Filipino about their devotion to this. I've been all around the world, trust me. There ain't basically no culture like the Filipino people who praise this thing right here, my friends. Oh my goodness. You know what the Filipinos are now? They're the new Irish. Really? Back in the old days, the Irish missionaries went to the whole world. Every parish had an Irish Father O'Shannon or Father O'Connell or whatever, right? Now, you got Filipino priests because Filipinos move in flocks, in family units. Wherever there's one Filipino, there's a hundred more coming. <laughs> Grandma, grandpa, auntie, auntie, sister, brother, they're all going to be living in that house. You know. And wherever they go, they bring this. They bring novenas to Our, our Lady of, you know, Peña Francia, Our Lady of Antipolo, everything. You name it, right? Some novena praying people. This thing has power, and God wants you to know about this. I guarantee you that if I asked you right now, how many of you got a, don't raise your hand or you really embarrass yourself. How many of you got a messed up marriage, got funky kids, got delinquent kids who are shacked up with their significant other in Sedona or San Francisco or Key West. <laughs> I'll bet you you do. Or you know somebody who is. Really? How many of you recently had, you know, you went on your Facebook and it was just rainbows. Oh, rainbows, just rainbows. <laughs> right? How many of you put a rainbow on yours? Yeah, no way is right. Because we're in a spiritual war right now. And it's serious. And it's going to get a lot more serious. A lot more serious. In the last century, you know there were more reported Marian apparitions than any other time in the history of the church? 
Many of these are approved. There's many that are not. Many are still under investigation by Vatican commissions and local bishops and whatnot. But many of them are approved. Many. I'm going to put on my glasses and read to you a few of them. And you know all of them are rosary related. And in some of them, Our Lady is very serious. And these are approved by the church. What are some of them? Well, we've got... Obviously, Fatima, right, 1917. We're coming up on the 100th anniversary of that one. Burang, Belgium, 1932 to 1933, approved. Rosary, Mary came with it in her hand. Banneau, Belgium, 1933, same thing. She came with the rosary in her hand. St. Faustina, we know that one. There's one right now that's controversial that may end up being approved this September. Lipa, Philippines, we'll see. Very interesting stuff there. Akita, Japan, 1973. Wow. Read those messages. Our Lady basically says that unless mankind repents, we're going to be wiped out. There's only going to be two things left, a sign and the rosary. You know what she says in there? Cardinals will be against cardinals, bishops against bishops, and there will be great confusion. Do we not see this today? Are we living on the moon? We're seeing this played out in the media, bishops against bishops. It's chaos. That was 1973, and that's approved. Cuapa, Nicaragua, where Our Lady even gave a history of the rosary to confound the critics and the skeptics. You don't think it was founded by St. Dominic? Go read the approved apparitions in Nicaragua, where she gave the visionary Bernard, who became a priest, a vision of men in white, Dominicans, praying the rosary. And she says that from the Dominicans, it was given to the Franciscans, and then it was given to everybody else. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I thought. (laughs) Cabejo, Rwanda. Right? Uh, You remember this one? This was one of the most prophetic. Sadly, the people didn't listen. The two tribes, the the Tootsies and the Hootsies or whatever they were. I I forget their names, right? (laughs) The two tribes there. They, They, one tribe basically massacred the other with machetes and over a million people died because they didn't listen to Our Lady. That's approved. Our Lady even, her heart was so hurting from this, she gave them what's called the Seven Sorrows Rosary. They thought it was brand new because nobody knew about it because Satan tried to basically bury it. It had been founded by the seven holy founders of the Order of Servites in the 13th century, same era as St. Dominic. She wanted to bring it back to life because the people needed it, but they didn't listen. And over a million people died by machete. She said, unless you listen to me, there will be rivers of blood. They didn't listen. There were rivers of blood. San Nicolas, Argentina, from 1983 to 1990. Actually, I believe the visionary is still living. Approved, Our Lady of the Rosary, and countless others. There are so many still happening right now. Remember the bishop I said just last year had had a vision of this? This is a bishop. We've been given great popes who have promoted this. St. John Paul II was basically a new St. Louis de Montfort who gave us a new set of mysteries, declared a year of the rosary, and everywhere he went around the world, he basically said this was his favorite prayer, and he asked people to pray it with him. But did we listen? I hate to say it, but I don't think we did. Do you? Do you not do at least one set of mysteries? 20 minutes? You can do it when you drive to work. Traffic probably is pretty bad in Phoenix, I don't know, but 20 minutes. Driving to work, doing whatever, you know, if you're waiting for something, you can do it. John Paul II actually said, don't be afraid to do it in public. You don't have to trumpet it, you don't have to walk down, I'm praying the rosary now. (laughs) Not, Not that, right? But there's nothing, have you ever seen somebody do this? I've seen it, and I'm edified. See a dude just walking his dog down the street, and he's got a rosary in his hand. Or when people see you doing it, they might want to do it too. I guarantee you that if you pray this as a family, you're going to have a correction to a lot of your problems. Your little arguments are going to seem stupid after you pray a rosary. Guarantee it. You know, there's a woman named Sister Elvira who started a rehab, if you even want to call it that. She doesn't allow any medication. What she does, she has them pray the entire rosary every day, do manual work, and fast. Do you know what the success rate of Sister Elvira's Chinacolo, means Seneca, rehabilitation program is? Almost 100%. 
Focus your mind. Even if it wanders, and it will. Nobody's prayed a perfect one of these probably since it was said by the angel, right? But when you keep refocusing your mind and your heart on our Lord, healing takes place. Healing of memories. Healing even in your body. I cannot tell you. They're going to be in my book. Miracle upon miracle upon miracle has happened. With this, this is medicine. This is like a, a, a life raft thrown from heaven. You better be packing this. I'll tell you this story. You know, the, uh, in France, there was a very educated young man studying science. He was on the train. And he got on the train, and there was this old man, all wrinkled and, you know, stooped over, and he was thumbing one of these through his fingers. And the young science student said to him, you know what? Old oh, man, what are you doing? I mean, this stuff is not, that's, that's, that's fairy tale. We, science, you know, has now, you know, proven things, and we, we don't need these little crutches and so forth. And the old man, in his humility, said, really, I, 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 I'm, I don't know what kind of science you're talking about. Please tell me. I'm interested to learn. So this young, you know, college student schooled this old man. And told him about, you know, all these things he was learning and, you know, how the Catholic Church was, you know, the great oppressor of, 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 of reason and people using their brains and so forth. So at the end of the trip, when the old man was about to get off at his station, the young man said, look, if you want to learn more, I'll tell you. Give me your name and contact information and I'll, 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 I'll give you more information about science. The old man went into his jacket and pulled out his card and he gave it to the young man. And on the card it said, Louis Pasteur, <laughs> the head scientist in France who basically discovered so many modern vaccines. The reason you don't basically have things like maybe polio and the reason you can basically drink milk today without getting some kind of disease or bacteria or so forth is because of him. He wasn't stupid. He wanted to be a saint. When you combine the two, intelligence and this, you got power. Now is the time for us to take up this weapon of war. Let me read you this quote, one of the more famous quotes that Our Lady said to St. Dominic when she gave it to him. She said, in 1208, You, St. Dominic, are to preach this devotion as a practice of piety most dear to my son and to me, as a most powerful means of dissipating heresy, extinguishing vice, spreading virtue, imploring the divine mercy, and obtaining my protection. I desire that this manner of prayer shall be perpetually promoted and practiced. The faithful shall obtain by it numerous benefits and shall always find me ready to aid them in all their wants. This is the precious gift which through you I bequeath to the world. <laughs> 